Hello, thank you, Lorian. Thank you, Rebecca, for putting me live here. Welcome to my little home office in New Plymouth, New Zealand. My name is Ingeborg Harvikost, and I would like to give you a little insight in how I charted, how I created a dashboard with um, the New Zealand COVID-19 situation and how that came about. So let's just right, jump into the presentation and you will be able to uh, put in questions in the Q&A and I will answer them at the end of the presentation. So thanks for joining me today and let's get this started. Let me just share my screen. This interface is a little bit slow, but we're getting on top of that. So, I went to the US in March and I returned on the 22nd of, um, uh, first of all, hang on, sorry, I forgot that. I need to acknowledge that we have sponsors and I wanted to do that at the beginning of that presentation so that I don't forget at the end and that we still have time to appreciate the sponsors that are instrumental in making this event possible. So thank you very much for that. When I went to the US in March, I returned on the 22nd of March and by that time everybody in New Zealand had to go into two weeks of self-isolation. So on Monday the 23rd I sat in my improvised home office and I was watching the figures and the numbers for COVID-19 in New Zealand and I thought, you know, I really want to see charts about that because I'm a visual person. I see the number 36 on one day and then the next day it says 40 new confirmed cases and then the next day it says 50 new cases and I thought nah, nah I really want something more tangible than that. So I looked around and I couldn't really find anything um, that there was no charts, there were no dashboards so I decided to make my own because I'm an Excel person. I turned to Excel. The Ministry of Health data had this website and on that website they had a few tables. I have managed for this presentation to go to the uh, Internet Archive Wayback Machine and pull a few of those historic versions of those pages but for that first one, the 25th of March, the Wayback Machine doesn't have a, uh, a historic page yet so I reconstructed this data. We had the details table that had a column for um, case number, a location, gender, an age group and then some free text details with, you know, were people on the flight, which flight was it, what date was it, when did they return, blah, blah, blah. So uh, looking at that data in a little bit more detail, I found quite a lot of inconsistencies. So for instance, the location contained cities, city names like Christchurch or Wanaka, but it didn't, well, but it also contained places like, or names like Canterbury, which is a region and not a place, or Southern DHB, which is a district health board. It's an organization. It's not even something that you can put on a map. So I wanted to have this in the same category. So I used a number of find and replace commands and I, I tried to figure out for each of these locations in which region they would belong because I wanted to put that on a map and also in a, a a list of uh, grouped categories, looking something like this. This was my first version in Excel. So we have a map, which is the star of the show, and then we have age distribution and gender distribution, and we have a list of uh, New Zealand regions and the numbers for that day. Now, I want to talk a little bit about the map and how you do such a map in Excel. Excel had, has had this field map for, uh, I've been working with it for about three years now. Uh, could be that in, in, yeah, three years ago it was still in preview. Um, so it, it all, it's fairly limited sometimes in its functionality unless you live in the US or unless the data that you plot is US-based data. For countries, regions that are outside of the US, you may run into problems. I've never tried to chart Australian locations but for New Zealand places I've made some um, discoveries and uh, a few 
discovered a few workarounds as well. So the map plots areas, not points. So it is a filled area map and that is quite important. So when you start to build a map, you need data for the area, which in um, when looking at the map, it is actually charting the New Zealand government boundaries for the regions. So given the regions, the names, Northland, Auckland and so on would be a good starting point. And, and just building a map with a value of one for each of these regions will show you whether you've, you've hit the region or whether it is still blank. So you do that, you put in a list of regions and a, and a couple of values, and then you go on the insert ribbon and click maps, field map, and then you expect that map to turn up. But what happens instead is that you get this error message. It says that you need geographical data. Well, give me a break. You have geographical data. So what is the problem? And after lots and lots of experimentation, not for this chart because I've been there before, I, I knew that it needs an S at the end of the word regions. It needs the precious regions. Otherwise, it will not plot that map. And you see here, when I put the S at the end of regions, the error goes away and it's starting to plot Northland and Auckland regions on the map. So that is one trick. I'm not quite sure what you all need for um, Australian data, whether it is the same there or not. Do your own research. Maybe you'll find some tips from Australian Excel MVPs to help you figure that out. So, I created the list of New Zealand regions and I put a value of one against that to make sure that I have all the regions covered and all the regions are spelled correctly in the way that Excel expects them. Because if you, if you make a typo or something like that, that region would not be filled. It would not be blue on this map. It would still continue to be grey. And the thing that I really, really do not like I have a stronger word for that, but I really do not like how this map is plotted with such a lot of white space around it. And the reason that I can see for such a lot of white space is where that arrow points, that's the Chathams, which are not in the list of my regions, therefore they're grey and don't stand out so much. So the Chatham Islands, which belong to New Zealand, are over there. OK, I could see that, but, you know, I could still want to squash the map down a little bit. I don't need all that big white space to the top and the left and the right. And I don't know whether there might be some obscure remote island somewhere which is just a pixel in here and, and legally belongs to New Zealand. And that is why they have to use such a big surface area for that plot of the map. And you cannot resize it. You cannot zoom in. And that means when you build that map into a dashboard, you have to deal with all that white space. And here is how I decided to deal with it. When I build a map, a, a dashboard with a New Zealand map, I draw out the map really big. I make it really, really big. And that is the orange line that you see in this screenshot here. And um, I push the map all the way up to the top and then resize it so that the first six or seven rows of the Excel spreadsheet are not required. And then I scroll down a little bit so that the first visible row is row seven. And then I freeze panes in Excel and um, build my dashboard in the confines of the green line or, or uh, outline that you see here. And then I can use other charts that I put on top of you're yeah, over the top of the um, underlying map chart or I can make the map chart background transparent and then I can still see the Excel grid in the background and I can use the Excel grid to show through that transparent background as well. And that is exactly what I've done in this first version of the dashboard where the table that you see at the left is using um, a column of values that are con uh, formatted with conditional formatting using the data bars. And then the whole thing is sorted by size and that's why that's such a nice curve. Um, and this pie chart and the edge distribution charts are just put on top of the map chart as I showed in the screenshot before. Now, this is a snapshot in time. It shows me what 
the situation was on the 24th of March. But I really wanted to have a little bit more history. I wanted to see a progression of how how did this situation, you know, um, develop over time and where might we be heading and where is this all going? So I needed some historical data because I knew that there was data for yesterday and the day before and all that. I just had to find it. And I turned to Wikipedia. And here is a screenshot of the Wikipedia page of that day that had numbers for the first uh, few cases in New Zealand with the dates that they were reported. And using those, I then built an Excel table with columns for uh, confirmed, uh, probable, total, recovered, and also uh, provisional columns for deaths and I only needed to plonk in the new numbers for the totals and then the new numbers, the change from yesterday would then be calculated automatically with a simple formula. That um, spreadsheet I would keep up to date every day manually. So when the daily press conference starts at one o'clock, I'm sitting there and I'm, as the Mr. Bloomfield speaks, I will put the numbers into that online dashboard and save it. And that is the manual thing that I, I thought that was the only manual thing that I needed to do. But with that, I could then build my line charts that show the time progression. So in the top right hand, the number of total cases, that is a line that will grow up and up and up and up and it will never go down because it is a running total. In the lower left hand corner, I have another line chart with two series and that is the number of active cases and the number of the recovered cases. And the idea here is that the number of active cases will rise and then over time it will start to fall and we will see fewer and fewer active cases. And here I have actually changed the conditional formatting the horizontal bars for, for the regions into a Excel chart and it's no longer conditional formatting. The age distribution is there and then we also have the daily cases as a vertical um, column chart to show how many new cases we have every day. And that was something that I felt could be looked at and gives me some information. I can also see that uh, Gisborne area and the West Coast area are still grey and there aren't any cases reported for those two uh, regions. So on to the next day and we saw a change or I saw a change in the data that was published on the Ministry of Health website. Now we the location column was replaced by a column called DHB, District Health Board. These are the regional authorities that manage um, the healthcare for people. And the district health boards have names, and that means that all this plethora of different names and place names and cities and regions and all that was a, mo a lot more consistent. The data quality was a lot better. And I had this table with the details, the individual cases per uh, DHB and I also had another table on another page that showed the, the total per DHB and when I looked at those two tables so on the left hand side we see the total cases by DHB and when I looked at the details table and I found that there were some differences in the way that the district health board names were treated. So for instance, Nelson Marlboro in one table it had a dash and the other it hadn't. And capital and coast in one it had an ampersand and in one it had the word and. And uh, there is the macron, the, the dash above the A for some in some Maori words, which uh, elongate the vowel, I think. So tarafiti in that table it had the dash above the A and the other in the other table it hadn't and I found in the details table like four different ways to spell Hawke's Bay with you know different characters used for the apostrophe or the back tick or a rogue S in there and typos so these were all indicators that um, this table was put together with um, the data input was uncontrolled, there was um, no uh, data validation and it's just human error that creeps in when you do these things. 
But I was able to use find and replace commands to make sure that my regions were spelled consistently in, in both tables after I'd pulled them in, into uh, Power Query. But the way bigger problem was the map. If we look at the regions, how Excel can plot them, and that is the New Zealand map on the left, that is the regions how Excel can plot them, although Excel only uses, no, 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 revert that. That is the regions how Excel can plot them. And on the right hand side, you see the regions as they pertain, pertain to district health boards, and you will see that they are not the same. Some, some of them are identical boundaries, but some of them are not. So if my number said I have 50 cases in, in the southern DHB, which is that big green blob at the bottom of the South Island, that actually consists of two regions, Southland and Otago. So into which province would I then put that number? And you know, other, other scenarios like that uh, made me come to a decision that I could no longer use Excel for that. I needed to be able to plot a point on the map instead of uh, shading a whole region because I could not get the district health board boundaries and I needed to plot a point on the map instead to represent the location of that district health board. So with a heavy heart, I decided that Excel had done its part and it was now time to move over and use Power BI. The good thing about this move was I didn't have to throw away any of my work because Power Query in Excel and Power Query in Power BI use exactly the same language. It's exactly the same code for Power Query and also for DAX, the formula language that uh, you use to create measures and uh, create sums and totals and stuff like that. So I could just open Power Query in the Excel workbook, open the query editor, copy out the whole code for the query and go into Power Query start a new query and paste it in and bang, everything was there. My connection to the website was there. It would pull the table, it would do all the renaming and replacing uh, and everything and nothing had to be done again. Oh, and that was, that, that is amazing. The way that Power BI and, and, and Excel work together is really helpful because I often start things in Excel and then finish them in Power BI. To do, the map in Power BI, I decided to build a table where um, I map the DHB name to a point on the map. In some cases, like uh, Bay of Plenty, I could just use that term and Power BI would find a, a dot on the map on its own. But if for some cases like Southern, for the Southern DHB, that was too unspecific, so I had to tell Power BI where to plot that. So I went into Google Maps and, you know, put my finger on the map uh, somewhere in the center of the area of the district health board and said, this is where I want that plot point. So where the green arrow or the green dot is, you see um, that we have Lumsden for the Southern DHB and for South Canterbury, we have Duntroon. And I just, it's arbitrary. It was my decision to plot the point there. And then in the uh, data model, I could put together, I could connect the um, location column uh, from my, uh, I could connect the two tables by, by uh, dragging the DHB to the region. I think I, I highlighted the wrong thing here. It shouldn't be on location, it should be on region. So region was connected to the, to the DHB of uh, column of my data table. And that then looked like this. This is my very, very first, very crude Power BI version of the dashboard. And you see the dots on the map and the number of cases is expressed in the different size of the point on the map. Later that day, I did a little bit more work on that and it, it ended up looking like this, where I have on the left hand side my horizontal bars for a breakdown by region and then those regions plotted on the map. 
my breakdown uh, by gender and age, and then the timelines for uh, total cases and daily new cases, and on the lower right-hand corner, the active and recovered cases. In the middle at the bottom is a detail table, and on the left-hand side, there is the um, infection cause that I tried to determine from the free text in the details column. I used a series of um, if commands to, to figure out, you know, if it says flight, it might be flight related, travel related and stuff like that. So came came up with that. I wasn't quite too happy about how, how this all emerged, but for that day I, I was done and I left it at that for that day. And I published this to the web and to do that, well, first of all, I published it to the Power BI service. And when it was live in the Power BI service, I then went into that report in the Power BI service and clicked on File, Publish to Web. And that would then give me a URL. I, uh, it gives you code that you can plonk into a web page as an iframe into a web page, or you can uh, just use that URL directly to go right to that dashboard and, and play around with it. Now, this, I, I am controlling, I'm the administrator of that tenant where, where I published that. So um, I was in total control of whether or not publishing to the web is allowed. The company administrators need to enable publishing of uh, Power BI reports to the web. Note this is different uh, to sharing reports and dashboards inside your company. Sharing with colleagues is not publishing to the web. That's a different command. Publishing to the web will put that dashboard on the web for everybody to see and all the data that is underlying that report will be publicly available and people can download it. And that is the exact reason why a lot of companies disable publishing to the web so that nobody inadvertently puts you know, all the financial details of a, of a company report on the web and uh, discloses a lot of confidential information. So the next day, I removed the cheery green in the color scheme of the dashboard and the uh, yeah, harmonized the colors a little bit more. The Ministry of Health had added probable cases to the overall totals and that's why we saw a little spike in the uh, daily numbers. And I also noted that I needed to explain those data inconsistencies and I put a few uh, text boxes on the web and I added a time slicer at the top of the map so you could scroll backwards and forwards in time to uh, see what the situation was on any particular day. You will also see that the plot points on the map have shifted slightly. I changed them to be the district health board headquarters. People were getting a little bit confused and I got some feedback that, you know, they clicked on Southern DHB, which here is um, the fifth or so uh, horizontal column, or they clicked the dot there and they ended up in, in the middle of nowhere and they were thinking, why does Lumsden have so many cases? That is somehow, so that, that wasn't a good idea to plot that in the middle of the region. So I decided to plot it as the district health board headquarter instead. And some details about that uh, will follow later. So this was the first version that I was really fairly happy with. Um, yeah. Then the next day, I saw that the had we had yet another new layout for the detail table. They removed the free text field for the details and replaced it with a, a number of columns for um, whether or not the travel was related to overseas, what the last city before New Zealand was, the flight number was in its own column now and not hidden in free text, the departure date and the arrival date of any traveller. So I needed to rebuild my own, my, my whole query. On top of that, they had this detailed information now for confirmed cases and another 
a table for the probable cases. So I have to combine two tables. So I load the first table, add a column for status equals confirmed, and load the second table, add a status for equals probable, and then I append the two uh, to the confirmed. So my confirmed table, now the, the table that I called confirmed contains confirmed and probable cases. And when I talk about the confirmed table from now on, it means it contains the confirmed and the probable cases. And here is what it looks like in Power BI in the query editor, where I have the report date, gender, age, DHB, whether or not it's overseas related, and all these other details. I also have a table called timeline that I have in Excel online, as I told, uh, explained before and these are the only two tables that I need to build this dashboard. Um, not really the only two but these are the, the two tables with changing data that I need and because both of these sources for the all these data sources are online one in an online excel spreadsheet and the other are in web tables on the public web page in theory I would have to do nothing to refresh that dashboard. In theory, it would just automatically refresh itself. You know, once the data on the web page changes, um, Power BI will do a refresh every so often. I'm not quite sure what the frequency is, but in theory, I wouldn't have to do anything to update that dashboard. But in practice, it looked quite different, as we will see. Um, so let's take a closer look at some of these charts and how they were made, right? So for the age distribution, on the left, you see the original data that I had where the data is given in words uh, or in text like 50 to 59, 20 to 29 or 70 plus, something like that. And I use a series of find and replace commands to replace that with uh, 40s, uh, 20s, 30s, 40s, teen, child for all those dis different age groups because uh, when I use my, I'm just going back to the previous slide, my age distribution here, I, I want the labels to be really short and I can't use longer labels otherwise they will slant sideways and that looks ugly. So I wanted short labels and I also needed to make sure that the labels are sorted in the correct order. And if I let Power BI just sort them, they will not end up in the order child, teen, twenties, something or other. And therefore I needed to build a sorting table for the age, that is a dimension table. So I have the age column on the right hand side in the dimension table, and it has um, all the words that I use, all the categories, and next to that it has a sort column which has numbers. And then you can go and tell Power BI to sort the age table, uh, sorry, to sort the age column by the sort column. I hope that makes sense. So when it comes to sorting by age, it will use the order in the sort column and not the alphabetical order that the age column would, would be sorted by. And that means when I use that in the dashboard, I will drag the age column from the age table into the axis well, or bucket as they are called in the visualization pane and I will drag the measure for the total cases into the values and that's all I have to do but before I do that I need to connect the two tables where I drag age from the age table onto age in my confirmed cases so I create a connection um, between those two tables and then I can drag the age from the age table and the total cases from the confirmed table into the wells and that is how the visualization will look. And like when I then sort, you know, now I can sort um, ascending or descending if I want to, and it will sort according to the sort column in the age table. I hope that makes sense. The next one I wanted to have a closer look at was the DHBs. So I went and had a look at 
uh, all the websites of the different district health board and figured out where the headquarters were. And then I found, you know, Bay of Plenty is actually in Tauranga, County Manukau is in Manukau, Hawke's Bay is in Hastings. And I put that into a column that I called plot and I put comma New Zealand in there because there are quite a lot of Wellingtons around the world. And unless you tell Power BI that you want to plot the Wellington in New Zealand, it puts it somewhere in, in Canada or somewhere obscure. And I really wanted to make sure that all my plot points are in New Zealand. So plot contains city name, comma, New Zealand. And with that, I can then connect my plot table with or my DHB's table, which has the plot column and I drag the DHB to the DHB of the confirmed cases table. So these are now connected via the DHB column. And then when I go to the map visual, I use the plot from the DHB table at the bottom and drag that into the location. And I use the total cases for the size of the bubble and I use the DHB name for the tooltip. And when you look at the tooltip, it says there um, not plot, but it says DHB HQ. And that is because once you have dragged a column into the well of the visual, you can actually use that little down arrow and rename that column. You do not have to use the same column name that you have in your table. That is quite powerful because you can name it anything. And sometimes you have tables that have similar columns with, with similar names, but you need to use naming conventions to, to make sure that you don't get confused when you look at that column. But once you pull it into a visual, you can rename it, you can call it anything you like, if that suits your purpose for that day. And then dates. I have a few charts that use dates, and whenever you use dates in Power BI in a chart in a table scenario, the recommendation is to actually create a date table, a separate table that deals only with dates, because in that table you can have uh, a lot of helper columns if you ever want to group your data by weekday or month or financial quarter or financial year, you build a date table that says this date belongs to this week to financial year such and such and it has the it's the weekday of such and such if you need those columns you can build those i'll show you how to build a quick date table with a dax formula you start by creating a new table from the ribbon it will have the name table and it will then give you the command in the formula bar which will be table equals and this is where you come in and or what I did here, I wanted to call it date table. So I put that into the formula bar date table equals and then the calendar function. The calendar function takes two arguments. The first one is the start date and the last one is the end date. And I decided to start with a date of the 26th of February 2020. And that is inside the date function because that was the first case reported in New Zealand. And I always want to end the date table on the current date. So I put today in there. So every time the query gets refreshed and recalculated, it will uh, advance the date table by, yeah, to be today, the current date. And that is all I needed. I didn't actually add any other columns for, you know, financial year or day of the year, uh, day of the week or whatever. But if you wanted to, you could do that here. And then I connected all my um, fact tables, the ones with the, with the new data every day. Uh, they have a date column. So I connected the timeline date column to the date table and I connected the report date of my confirmed table to the uh, data to the date table. And from there on, I could then drag the date table date whenever I wanted to use a time axis. And I dra drag that date table into the axis well, and then I can uh, drag my um, drag my measures and my sums and totals and all that into the values area. So that is what it looked like on the 28th of March, and that is how I made it. 
Next day, I found that the table headers were changed in the website table, for the, but only in the table for the probable cases, which was like a thousand rows below the, the start of the table above it. So my, my query uh, refresh didn't work. I got errors and I had to, to figure out what those errors were. And I found that, oh, they changed the heading names. So I had to go in and fix the query in Power BI for Desktop and um, save it and republish it to the web. Then the table headers changed back one day, the next day, and I had to do all that again because my query bombed again and I had to change it. And this time they also changed um, a column name in the first table. All right, so I fixed up my query, republished the report, and off we went. The next day, they changed the table headings again, and I decided I'd had enough. I was I was kind of over it with changing the the uh, table column headers every day. So I had a look at the um, options here and decided I could use some Power Query to help me deal with that problem. And this is how you can do that. When you load the data, Power Query will often automatically use the first row as headers. It, it has some algorithm built into it that identifies that. And I thought, I don't want that. So I deleted that command to use the first row as headers. And instead, I made sure that it used the headers as the first row. And using the headers as the first row then meant that the first row of the table were, were the text values for those um, columns and whatever they put in there on that day, the flavor of the day, I didn't care because in the next step, I then went and I deleted, I removed the first row. There's a command for that on the ribbon, remove rows, remove top rows, and then it asks you how many rows at the top you want to remove. You click, I entered one, enter, boom. And then I could just comfortably rename the columns to what I wanted the names to be. And I never had to touch that again for the rest of the duration. The 1st of April, I could do a straight refresh. Nothing, nothing went wrong. No structural changes, smooth sailing. Whoa. But that was my April Fool's Day. That's because on the 2nd of April, they decided to swap two of the columns. Now, no renaming or removing first rows will change the data types or will swap those columns. So I really had to go into the queries again and make sure that my query uh, accounted for the fact that the, the arrival date and the flight number had now changed positions. The next day, we there was a new table on the page that I used to pull the numbers per DHB. The numbers per DHB is grouped by, um, it is in a table called to total cases by DHB, and it was the second um, second table on that page. Excuse the highlighted line, that is a, is a rogue thing, it shouldn't be there. Uh, this here, the blue arrow shows how I clicked on that table, on that row, on that word, to actually expand the table called total cases by DHB for that date. But, and that that is why we have the highlight here, the, that will create a formula that says source one of the data. And it indexes, starting the first row is index zero, the second row is index one. So that is why it says source one and not source two. So source one means take the second table on that page. But that no longer worked because on that day, the second table on that case page was total cases in hospital and not total cases by DHB. So I thought, oh no, here we go again. They they might, you know, end up uh, putting new tables on that page and I will forever have to adjust my queries and, and figure out the, uh, the position of that table. And then I thought, no, there must be a better way. And there is because you can use, on, in that step, you can use the filter button and then filter to uh, define a query that filters by the text. And I used the contains parameter and said, okay, if that uh, line contains the words total cases by DHB, 
it looks like this in the formula bar, like this in, at the bottom here, but you don't have to type it in the formula bar. It's quite easy in, in the user interface. Sorry, I didn't take a screenshot of that, but, but I never actually entered anything in the formula bar. So that filtered down the table that has the words total cases by DHB, and I ignored the rest of that, and I used that table for the, for the rest of my processing, and that has never failed again. Um, oh, and on that day, they also swapped the columns back, the flight number and the arrival date. They were, uh, so I had to do that as well. Um, the next day we had a column name change. The next day we had two, the, the, the confirmed cases were on that page twice, so my numbers spiked, and I thought, oh my God, what's happening now? And I found that they somebody had by mistake put that table on there twice. So my fix was then not to use the web table anymore, to download the Excel file instead and use the data from the Excel file. This required a manual refresh every day, but uh, automation was not possible because when I looked at the Excel file names that they had used, um, there was no rhyme or reason to why the Excel file was called anything. So I could not really automate that. I didn't want to spend the time. It was quicker for me to just download the Excel file, rename it myself and refresh it. Then we finally come to what it looked like through to the end with a few layout changes. I added a series to the daily new cases because what they said on the press conference and what was discernible from the details data was quite different. So I plotted both of these values in the vertical bars. And uh, on one day on a, in April, they actually split and they only showed the confirmed cases on the website and had uh, sorry, had the confirmed cases for April on the website and everything that was before April, um, I could get from the Excel spreadsheet. So I thought, well, wow, yeah, why don't we, why don't I, you know, do a combined query and use the static data for March and earlier and the dynamic data from the web page. And I did that, but on the next day, I found that um, there were data inconsistencies. They still changed March data during April, and I rolled back to using the Excel spreadsheet. By 16th of April, we had a new columns, new columns in the DHB table, which were welcome because they showed uh, broken down by DHB what the active and recovered cases were, and I could finally build my version of the dashboard with uh, some positive uh, and this is the last update that I did here uh, with the um, recovered cases stacked on top of the bars and also added into the little dots so they look like little pie charts on the map. Um, this is now if you if we have time for QR uh, for Q&A we can do that now here is the slide with the QR code if you want to enter the price draw and um, I don't know how long I have to show that for but I'm open for questions now if Lorian tells me if there is anything. Hi Inga that was fascinating um, I can see why you're an Excel MVP it's really really interesting stuff um, and it's Megan not Lorian sorry. Okay. Um, one question that has actually popped up. When the government releases the information, did you have to manually put the data in your table or do you have some ways to pull data automatically from the website to your table? So the, if I use the table that is on the web, um, Power BI will eventually, the Power BI service will eventually refresh that data on the web. But I had the timeline table where, where I manually added each day and then added the number of uh, new probable and new to new uh, confirmed cases and number of new deaths and all that and number of recoveries. That is something that I had to do every day, but I didn't need to actually open Power BI to do that. I just had to update my Excel table and Power BI would theoretically pull that data automatically. But because of all these changes and data quality issues that I experienced over the days, I actually, every day I opened Power BI desktop to refresh and then republish that report. But generally, if your data lives on the web, you do not have to manually enter it somewhere to refresh it. Thank you.
And thanks for the person um, for asking that question. There's a few others I've responded to. Um, so any other final words from you before we sign off? Well, I just wanted to give you some ideas about uh, how, you know, what obstacles you can run into when you try and um, get data from a public website and uh, that it's not always smooth sailing, but I hope that people got a few hints and tips from me and will apply that to their own dashboards and reports. Thanks for watching. Thanks for presenting. Tune in to the next one shortly, everybody. Thank you, Inga. Great presentation. Cheers, bye.